at some point, as I assume at the, at the end of 90s, the right to know movement started. Something special happened or just friends met and wanted to start that. So if you can come back because you are in, an important person in these times starting this movement. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting question. I would say, in fact, in my mind, as you were asking the question, I went back to, uh, I think, the 3rd of November, 1993, in the former Warsaw Pact headquarters in Warsaw, in, at a meeting of the Organization of Security and Corporate for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which I always remember was the very first time that I personally spoke in public about the right of access to information. Um, I didn't really know that I was doing it exactly, but I was at a meeting where we were discussing freedom of expression and secrecy in the new democracies after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And everyone was talking about secrecy as something that was the norm. And there were exceptions to secrecy if a journalist, for example, could get access to that information. And I very, very sort of young, naive and nervous had this idea and spoke up and from things I had read and heard from other people and said, um, I think we're starting at the wrong point. We should start by assuming that all information is public and only limited information should be made secret. Nobody reacted. I felt like, oh, what have I said? It seems so obvious to me, but it, no one reacted. And then afterwards in the corridors, a few people came up to me and said, that was a really interesting point. And people from different countries, I think there was a lady from Romania said to me, you know, we've been talking in Romania about doing something link similar to the U U US Freedom of Information Act. And those, that for me was immediately interesting. And as I traveled around a lot of Central and Eastern Europe uh, really intensively in 94, 95, 96, working mainly on media laws, and the new radio television laws, because I was working at Article 19 at the time, I encountered many people uh, in different countries, not joined up at that point, but many people who were working on the idea of having a freedom of information or access to information law. And I, it's really interesting looking back because at that point in history, there were only about 14 laws around the world. Sweden had got its law from 1766, but in the United States, 200 years later in 1966, Finland, France, and the Netherlands, 1978, administrative information being opened. But it really wasn't until the fall of the Berlin Wall and all people who had once lived, uh, what is for me, on the other side of the Berlin Wall, for you, it was, in, it was your side of it. Um, all the people who had understood the importance of information as something absolutely essential for a democracy, for defending human rights. And it came up almost spontaneously all over the place. Of course, people are reading, people are learning about democratic systems in other countries, but it was also something very intrinsic in an idea of we need information in order to have a more just society. So that continued. And then in 1997, I went to Bulgaria. So only three, four years later, because it was a summer, a hot summer day in 1997, I went to Bulgaria and I met Gagana Yuliva and Alexander Kashimov, who were the founders of the very first access to information organization in any of the former um, from a communist countries. And indeed at that point, apart from the UK, which had a campaign for freedom of information, no country in the whole of Europe uh, had an NGO specializing in this right. So that takes us to 1997. 
And then it, it really took off. Everyone was talking about it. People were exchanging information about having access to information laws. Uh, and you can ask me for details and I can go back, but I'll jump forward to uh, September the 28th, 2002, when uh, at a meeting I organized, in fact, the first meeting I organized was with Open Society Funds in April 2001 uh, in Budapest, but then we had another meeting in September 2002 with people from people working on access to information from all across Europe and from other parts of the world. We had someone from South Africa, someone from India, someone from Mexico, at least those countries. And we actually had this idea of creating a formal network. Um, so in a space of nine years, we went from really no one talking particularly about this concept, although a lot of people had it in their minds, to creating a formal network that's the foundation of this movement that still continues today. And we can talk about where it is today. But that's my first uh, thoughts about the essence of the origin of a movement across the whole of Europe. After that, uh, I traveled, I started working in 2002, in fact, in that very same year that we founded the Freedom of Information Advocates Network and created the idea on that very 28th of September of having a special day for access to information. In that same year, I started working in Latin America, in Mexico, in Peru, later in Chile, in Argentina, and so on. And I invited people from Central and Eastern Europe to travel to, uh, we had some from Hungary who went to Mexico, we had some from Bulgaria who went to Argentina, for example, I took a lady from Ireland to Chile and so forth. So we started building the bridges between the region of Central and Eastern Europe that was already advancing with access to information laws and the nascent movements a little bit later in the democratization of those countries in the Americas. And so that's the point at which it also started going global, actually. I, and how was it with the standards? Because th this is something that surprised me when I realized that many standards that we have in our access to information law have some logics that was known before. It's not that our lawmakers developed that, but it's something that exists, like the, how long it should be. Of course, periods are different, but the fact that it should be informal, that, um, that there is this, as far as I remember, at some point we, we found some list with the, like 10 points that good access to information law should meet. So you were working together on the basis on Mm, observation or discussion or what <laughs> <laughs> or or just enthusiastic idea idealism um it was it's a very interesting question and, and it's one that's i think really really important because it has created laws which are have their differences but are really very similar around the world and that helps enormously i think we can thank i can thank at least for my work on it two sources one is that rather amazingly, as early as 1981, 1981, the Council of Europe adopted a recommendation to member states, which is only available as a scanned PDF. I can share it with you if you like. Um, they, a recommendation to member states on access to information. Bear in mind that at that point, only about five or six countries in the world had an access to information law. But nevertheless, there was that early recommendation. I think we can thank the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, that really had this idea and were promoting it. They were always very active in promoting this model of a right of access to administrative documents. I mean, in Sweden, from the beginning, from the date I've already mentioned, 1766, it was in the constitution. It was linked to freedom of expression linked to the freedom of the press law. So it really is amazing. It took the rest of the world a long time to catch up with these enlightenment ideas, but anyway. So 1981, we have this, the Council of Europe has a document. 
And when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and the Council of Europe was the body in charge of promoting democracy, rule of law and human rights and working on the reform of institutions and legal frameworks, they had already to hand this recommendation. And in fact, in 2002, they strengthened that recommendation uh, with the list of exceptions, for example, uh, through a process that was took place in 2001, 2002, which already this, this, this new nascent civil society movement engaged in that process. Um, roughly the same time, and also definitely thanks to the Swedish government, in 2001, the Council of Europe uh, adopted the Regulation 1049, a really unsexy name of Regulation 1049, but it's the Council of Europe's access to documents rules. And it was the Swedish government and also the Finnish Ministry of Justice was involved that pushed that. And you can see a lot of similarities between the 2001 rules from the European Union that apply to European Union institutions and the Council of Europe's 2002 recommendation. So it was a combination, I would say, of some enlightened governments working with civil society. The one other thing that was absolutely crucial, and I think also has a, a special Central and Eastern Europe dimension to it, is that in 1998, the Aarhus Convention on Access to Environmental uh, the access to environmental information had been adopted. And the environmental movement had been given a real sort of push on this because of the, and in fact, if I, I talked, I've talked to activists, access to information activists from Central and Eastern Europe, who told me that they started becoming aware of the need for information back in 1986 with Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And we can analyze the extent to which Chernobyl and the lack of information and the concerns about that contributed to the fall of the Berlin Wall. There are theories about that. But in any case, information, it was about information. Uh, and I think that that gave a real push to the environmental movement's insistence on having a special right of access to environmental information, which led to the Aarhus Convention in 1998. The Euro it's a European region, it's a UN convention, but for the European region. And uh, the combination of that movement with the, uh, the work of the Nordic countries and this growing civil society, civil society movement was important. What we did, and I say we, I was definitely one of the people, I'm happy to take credit for this, I like to be modest. I think there are a lot of people who work on this, but I definitely, I, I'm, I'm someone who loves putting order on things, you know? I used, my bookshelf, it has its logic, I promise you. Um, but when I was a kid, I put numbers on all my books. I think I wanted to be a librarian when I was a kid. Um, and I've still got books with numbers on. They only went up to six because I only had six spaces in my bookshelf in my room and one, two, three, four, five, six, anyway. Um, so I like putting orders on things and putting numbers on, thi on things. So I think I was one of the people who said, let's make this 10 principles. Ten and this was the yeah, 10 principles. Ten principles. And basically, when you've got a good formula and it works, don't change it. That's a, a great lesson for everything in life. Um, so I would go around countries in Europe. I'd be in Serbia and in Montenegro and in Bulgaria and in Slovenia and Slovakia. And I'd suggest at the conference, hey, why don't we draft 10 principles? And look, we've already got some principles. So we basically, every national access to information law movement was copying, slightly improving on maybe, but copying the principles that other people had adopted elsewhere. Um, for example, I can remember it, it must have been in around, it was a very cold January day, I would say 2002 in Croatia, snow everywhere, Zagreb, absolutely beautiful. And the meeting didn't last very long because I've got, look here, I've got the 10 principles. Let's just do it. <laughs> and that was the basis of the Croatian law, which is, was one of the better ones because it came after some of the earlier ones. Uh, just now on the 1st of December, 2020, the new Council of Europe Convention on Access to Official Documents 
uh, which has been signed and ratified by 10 member states. A few more are going to do so next year. And it's very exciting that the world's first treaty on access to information, which reflects a lot of those principles that we in civil society were promoting for the last 15 or more years. So it's really exciting to see that. It's mainly the sort of Nordic countries. Uh, we call the convention the Tromsø Convention after a, a lovely city north of the Arctic Circle, which I've been to, I'm very lucky to have been to, um, called Tromsø, which is where the convention was formally adopted. Uh, and uh, it's Nordic countries, the ones who were pushing from the beginning, Finland, uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden, plus some countries in the Balkans with very good access to information laws. Spain will ratify by the end of next year, which is great news. Um, and a few other countries are going to ratify as well. Um, it's something you could be promoting in, in Poland. Why would it be a good thing? Because there is a monitoring committee which will oversee the implementation of the convention. open government partnership that Poland, unfortunately, is not a member of. We tried several times, several years ago, in 2013, I think, 14, and then just gave up. Uh, and I have the f a feeling that now the discussion is there, but I don't know to what extent. Uh, but obviously, meetings and some platform for collaboration is important. Right? Yes, I mean, I think I think you're right. There was a very intense period, the golden age of getting access to information laws adopted. And that was great fun. And then we realized that there's that's only the first step and it's hugely hard work to get them well implemented. And now each of us in our country is focused on, on doing that. You know, we've got the standards, we've got the laws and now we have to heads down, sleeves rolled up and we have to work. Um, and we have to encourage citizens to request information because it's very frustrating for citizens who have heard about this fantastic right and the law and then ask for information and don't get it or don't get an answer or get a rejection. And, you know, the reality of making this work in practice is a different thing. It's, it's harder work, it's less fun perhaps. But anyway, I think something else happened. I was talking about emails. We then started having government websites and we had the open data movement. Governments were able to publish information proactively on their websites. The combination of the access to information laws and the open data movement came together to create the open government partnership. And we increasingly realize how important transparency is in the fight against corruption, in controlling corrupt or not particularly democratic politicians because for the golden age of the 90s, really from the 2000s onwards, we start seeing problems in transitional democracies, but we're aware of problems all around the world. Um, and so we needed to keep insisting on this. Um, and it's true that we're not only asking for access to information laws generally, we're asking for a lot of things. We want our company registers to be open. So we know who really the owners of the companies are and we want public procurement, we want to see who's getting the contracts from government. So there are lots of different things to work on. Um, the Open Government Partnership started in 2011. It will be 10 years old next year. Uh, in fact, I spent most of today on a steering committee call of the Open Government Partnership. Next year is going to be a very important year. Um, it is a, a forum where the debate on openness has been taking place, that's for sure. And for the countries, the 78 countries and now around 50 local governments, regional or municipal governments that are members, it's a great place to be. And it really makes a difference. I'm speaking to you this evening from Madrid in Spain. And I arrived in Spain 15 years ago, almost exactly. And nobody even knew what a transparency law was. Now we have the entire country, the central government, all the regional governments doing open government action plans. Really, it's been a, a huge transformation. Um, and being inside the open government partnership has helped that. So it's a huge shame that Poland is not a member. There are 22 countries in the EU, I think, that are members in the European, wider European region. I think it's 32 of the 47 Council of Europe members. So you're, 
you're in a small number that are not members. Um, obviously, it's a question of political will from your government. Keep insisting on being inside the Open Government Partnership. Uh, I, think, I think it is something that is, does help focus attention because governments have to do an action plan and they have to make commitments and they have to do that in collaboration with civil society. So it's true, it is where the action is a little bit, Kasher. It, it's, uh, it's something that we should maybe try harder to collaborate to get Poland to join. Hungary joined and then, and left then when and then left, left for no, they were they were going to be suspended and they left of their own accord they were going to be suspended because they hadn't done the action planning consultation with civil society they were passing laws which were putting pressure on civic space on academic freedom on freedom of information so they were under scrutiny the really unique thing and the very good thing about the open government partnership is that it does actually uh, analyze whether member states are complying with the basic ground rules. And it's ready to, Azerbaijan was also suspended, is suspended. And Turkey and Russia came under pressure and left. <laughs> there is a lot to achieve, but we have achieved a lot. And if I may, Kasha, I'd like to mention one other thing that we didn't really mention. Mm -hmm. which is, you were asking me about the early days, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where do we start on this right to information movement? When we started, or even in 2002, when we formed the Freedom of Information Advocates Network globally, the right of access to information was not seen by any of the international human rights bodies as a fundamental right. Then in 2006, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights recognized it as a right linked to freedom of expression. The court basically said, if I'm going to have a right to form my own opinion and to express my opinion freely, I need information. So freedom of expression means access to information. And then three years later in 2009, the European Court of Human Rights said the same thing. If the government has a monopoly on information, we have a right to that information so that we can form our opinions and express them. And then in 2011, the UN Human Rights Committee said the same thing. So when we think about progress and how slow progress can sometimes seem to be, let's not forget that in the last 15 years, no more than that, all the international human rights bodies have recognized that the right of access to information is our right as citizens. It's a fundamental human right, which we need to be informed just because we want to be informed, but also to defend our other human rights, to defend our democracy. So in, if you're feeling a bit uh, not completely optimistic about the world, COVID, climate crisis, ugh, what next? Um, I do think that there is progress being made nevertheless. And I think it's up to all of us now to work together to defend these rights and to make sure that we do come out of this crisis, the COVID crisis, with a bit more solidarity, maybe solidarity, there's a, a Polish concept if ever there was one, uh, a bit more solidarity and uh, maybe committed to actually make the recovery from this COVID crisis one that makes the world somewhat better.